Hello and welcome to another edition of Elections Unlocked. Only this time we are not looking at what's happening domestically, but my colleague De- Geeta Mohan, our uh, foreign affairs editor, and I will be looking at what's happening in the battle for United States. Trump versus Kamala Harris. Absolutely. Uh, hello, Rajdeep. In the next half hour, we will be bringing you all the latest on U.S. presidential elections this year, 2024, and it's going to be rather interesting. You know, it's been a big election year, Gita, for India. You had the general elections, you had several state elections, a couple of more still to go. For the United States, is this also, in your view, a defining election in many ways, which is why the world's attention is there? Kamala Harris trying to become the first woman president versus Donald Trump hoping to come back four years after he was eased out. It's fascinating. It is fascinating, but it is going to be a defining one because at this juncture, you have two wars. And the United States of America is playing a critical role, but is also fighting for that supremacy. And in that, uh, Kamala Harris trying to prove herself. If Trump returns, things are going to look very different, Rajdeep. So yes, it's defining not just for the United States of America, if Kamala Harris comes, the first woman president, but also for the world and global politics. Okay, great. So we've got plenty on this show of Elections Unlocked U.S. special. But first up, this Sunday at Madison Square Garden in New York, in a Donald Trump rally, a comedian called Puerto Rico an island of garbage before a packed house. It's been the latest targeting of an island territory that has long suffered, many believe, from mistreatment. Puerto Ricans can't vote in general elections despite being U.S. citizens, but they can exert a powerful influence with relatives on the mainland. How is this all going to play out? Let's listen in first to that controversial remark and how Republican candidate and former U.S. President Donald Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, has now tried to distance their campaign from it. Take a look. It is absolutely wild times. It really, really is. And, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. Okay. All right. (laughs) Okay. We're getting there. Again, normally I don't follow the national anthem, everybody. Uh... This isn't exactly a perfect comedy setup. There's some people here. All right. Very good. Can we all just take a chill pill and take a joke from time to time? This is ridiculous. Our country... Our country was built by frontiersmen who conquered the wilderness. We are not going to re... We're not going to restore the greatness of American civilization if we get offended at every little thing. Let's have a sense of humor and let's have a little fun and let's go win in eight days. God bless you all. Thank you. You know, right through this campaign, Gita, we've seen what critics are calling dog whistles, incendiary rhetoric. The Trump campaign and you heard J.D. Vance saying, let's have a sense of humor. Has this become very polarized? You've been tracking this campaign for several months now. Is it arguably getting even more shrill and polarized? And how does this play on on the electorate, given that both sides seem to have very strong constituencies uh, virtually competing with each other? I think, uh, Rajdeep, this is a plan. It's a strategy, and they have worked it out very well. Uh, Saying that, you know, let's have a sense of humor is not just just saying it out of the blue. They have a plan in place. They did it with the Haitians. They're doing it with the Puerto Ricans. Uh, They had the entire race comment when it comes to Kamala Harris herself. This is consolidation of the Republican vote. back. The anti-immigrant rhetoric you're saying is part of a deliberate strategy to consolidate the vote. Absolutely. Because they know that they're not getting these votes. So might as well go the other way where if there are other sitting fence sitters, Mm -hmm. Republicans who might not be very happy with maybe some of the policies. There are women who are questioning Trump on abortion. Um, But you're consolidating, Gita, your base vote. What you're saying, you're consolidating your base vote. But eventually elections are won and lost, possibly on turnout, who comes out to vote, but importantly also getting the floating vote, the fence sitters. Are fence sitters comfortable? You believe with this kind of rhetoric from what you're seeing? In fact, if not anything else, it's not just the vote bank that they have already consolidated or who are Trump voters. We're talking about the the, the swing states, Rajdeep, where immigration is an issue. 
Now, if you're talking about immigration and immigration being an issue, this is exactly what they're doing. Okay, very, very interesting. And maybe there are some parallels when, uh, with elections that take place in this country as well. But go ahead. Uh, All right. Deepa. Now, the Democratic Vice President candidate Kamala, ha Vice President Kamala Harris is competing with Trump to win over Puerto Rican communities in Pennsylvania and other swing states. Now, this time, approximately 244 million people are eligible to vote in the upcoming U.S. presidential election on the 5th of November. Four years ago, about two-thirds of these eligible voters participated. This time, the outcome of the presidential election will hinge less on the national voter turnout and more on a few thousand voters in key battleground or swing states. Here's why. It is the intense campaign time for both U.S. presidential candidates. This is the last week, last chance to woo the voters. All right, we got business to handle. Okay, so Ann Arbor, I have a question for you. Are we ready to do this? Yeah. Are we ready to vote? Yeah. Are we ready to win? Yeah. Yes. And we will win. And we will win. And as it gets closer, the heat rises. You know, she's not a nice person. Does anybody know that she is not a nice person? In case you had any ideas. Did you see she used the F word the other day? She thought she was talking without a camera on. She used the F word. Did you see that? Oh, it's terrible. If that ever happened to me, you would, it would have been front page headlines. Oh, boy, oh, boy. No, they got her using the wrong word, camera. In the last leg, both candidates have decided to go full throttle on the swing state campaigning. There are seven states in the election, the ones that do not favor any one party over the other. Arizona with 11 electoral votes. Both Georgia and North Carolina hold 16 electoral votes each. And Pennsylvania has the maximum 19 electoral votes. While Nevada has 6, Wisconsin 10 and Michigan 15. Whosoever is able to swing these 7 states or scores the maximum among them will hit the home run. So it's all daggers out campaign at this crucial last hour. And we are, we're closer to... World War III than we've ever been. We've never been so close. And we're going, to be, we're going to be closer yet because we have people that don't know what they're doing unless we win. But even then, you have a period of time before January 20th. And we're going to, we're going to win this thing. We've got to win this thing. And if we don't win it, we're not going to have a country. It's not going to be good. But I hear everything from what I hear is it's not only going to be a victory, it's going to be a big, fat, beautiful victory. That's what we do. You all have heard me say, I do believe Donald Trump to be an unserious man, but the consequences of him ever being president again are brutally serious, brutally serious. Consider on the topic we were just discussing, Donald Trump still refuses to acknowledge the pain and suffering he has caused. He insists that, quote, everyone wanted for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. Democrats had Obama rallying hard for Kamala Harris. His name is Elon Musk. Republican nominee lured the crowd with the promise to bring the tech giant Musk on board if he's the president. And we're going to bring Elon in. So he wants to, he doesn't need to be a secretary. He doesn't want to be secretary. He wants to be a man that can cut costs, have you live even better. You're not going to be affected. But I think he said $2 trillion. And nobody would do it better than him, and he's going to do it very responsibly, and uh, we have to... It's amazing that, you know, he just wants the country. That's why he endorsed me very strongly. Elon Musk, the guy is incredible. And he endorsed me so... And he... You know where he is right now? He's campaigning in Pennsylvania. He's been doing it since he landed that crazy rocket ship. 
we have to reject the kind of politics of, of, of division and hatred that we saw represented. America's ready to turn the page. America's ready for a better story. Philadelphia, we are ready for a president, Kamala Harris. We are a new generation of leadership. How will these seven states vote will decide whether America will get its first woman president. And we will make America great again. Or a second Donald Trump term. Bureau Report, India Today. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Now, elections are also about poll data, Rajdeep, and we have uh, pollsters who are giving out data and numbers almost on a daily basis. Ipsos is one such agency. Clifford Young, president of Ipsos Public Affairs, joins us uh, to discuss what's happening on the ground. Thank you so much, Clifford, for joining us here on the India Today Network. Now, for our viewers, explain to us which are the swing states this time around, because they do keep changing every election, barring a few states, and what are the factors that really make them too close to call. Yes, and so in the United States, uh, there's no such thing as a popular vote, like summing up the entire population that voted and then whomever is in, in the lead wins. Indeed, in the United States, there are 50 separate state elections. Um, and the swing states are those states um, that are, are very close um, and, and they ultimately decide um, whether one candidate wins or not. Uh, there's seven in total. Uh, those seven are Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. They're in the Midwest. They're in what we call the Rust Belt, the old factory region. Um, we, have, we have two states in the West, Nevada and Arizona. And then we have two states in the South, Georgia and North Carolina. Those seven states uh, ultimately decide the election because of the, they're the states with, that are the closest. Uh, they swing back and forth uh, from Republican and Democrat. And those are the states we're focused on. But the, polls, but the polls are also showing a virtual dead heat. Is there any of these swing states that today can be called safely Trump or Harris? <coughs> yeah, nothing is safe. Uh, what, what we can say is the southern states like Georgia and North Carolina are trend more Trump. Um, Traditionally, the Rust Belt states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, trend Democrat. But today, they're very, very close. And indeed, if you, if you take the aggregation or some of the polls, uh, Trump is in the lead in each of those key swing states. Is Pennsylvania the key? Because it has the most delegates among these swing, swing states. Who wins Pennsylvania this time? If one could well decide who is the next president in the White House. I believe it will be. Now, we will see. <laughs> um, th the future is always unpredictable. Uh, but uh, Pennsylvania is a large state. Um, it has a lot of delegates, 19 in total. Um, and uh, it is neck and neck there right now. I, I, it's basically 50-50, Harris and Trump. Um, that is the state that I'm focused on. Um, that's the state that most analysts are focused on. And indeed, I believe that will be the state that ultimately defines and decides who goes to the White House. Right. Uh, Clifford, now, would it be right to say that uh, Trump really has the momentum now because uh, they have, he's really closed in on the points? They're just a uh, point difference between uh, Trump and Harris. Has he really uh, managed to catch on? Yes. And so at the national level, um, the, you know, he has narrowed the difference. Um, Harris is still in the lead. Because um, she leads by a lot in states like California and New York. But in the key swing states, it's trended Trump ever so slightly. We're talking about a point here, a half a point there. But in each of the swing states, uh, he's made up ground. Um, and indeed, depending on how you put the data together, he leads in all those uh, seven swing states. Is there, though, also a growing gender gap between the candidates and therefore could turn out make a difference? Does Harris need more women to turn up to win, given this gender gap, more men voting for Trump, more women voting, it appears, according to the polls, for Harris? 
Yeah, and so it will be about turnout. I mean, we're talking about um, a half a percent or a percent in these states. Indeed, maybe we're only talking about 200,000 votes or so in the key swing states. And so it will be about turnout, 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 getting your base out. Um, uh, the Trump camp is really emphasizing not just the economy, but immigration. Um, the Harris side is not emphasizing just the economy, but they're emphasizing threats to democracy. Um, on both sides, uh, they want to get their people out because that could define ultimately who wins the election. When it comes to women, it's a it, it's a key constituency, obviously, versus men. Um, we have a long term trend, not just in the United States, but globally, where we find that men t are t trending more conservative. Uh, women are trending a little bit more liberal or progressive. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, um, ultimately, those critical issues like like uh, the economy, like threats to democracy, like uh, immigration, and like abortion for women uh, will ultimately uh, activate people and, and make sure they go to the polls and vote. Right. Um, you just mentioned immigration, uh, and let's just talk about that. Immigration, unemployment, inflation, Clifford, all these are issues that uh, the Biden-Harris administration has had to deal with. So is Harris on the back foot? Is she carrying a baggage? And how will that really play out? Yeah, uh, the economy and uh, excuse me, the economy and inflation are problematic issues for Harris uh, because she's part of the Biden administration, and the Biden administration was leading the country when inflation spiked. Um, and so uh, the economy is complicated for her side. It's difficult to message on that side. It really gives an advantage uh, ultimately to Trump. On immigration, immigration is much more of a secondary issue, an issue much more used um, to motivate the base. Uh, it's much more of a Republican issue. It's an issue that Trump is using over and over and over again in his speeches. Um, his campaign advertising uh, not just emphasizes uh, in the economy inflation, but also immigration. Uh, but both sides are using their, 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 their pet set of issues, let's call them, uh, the unique set of issues for their base to get their base out. And, and Trump is using immigration uh, on the one hand, and uh, Harris, on the other hand, threats to democracy and abortion. Right. Um, again, abortion, another issue, a very important one at that. Uh, and Trump has a very specific, strong stance when it comes to abortion. Will that impact Trump in the swing states? Yeah, it's really, uh, like, like I said, it, it, it's a secondary issue behind inflation. It's one that 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 Harris is using to reinforce her credibility. She's strong on the issue. Um, they are targeting, uh, especially moderate Republican women in suburbia in in the suburbs um, that could be convinced by an anti excuse me uh, a, a pro abortion pro choice uh, a message, uh, and that that's how it, it's playing out specifically. Uh, Trump is trying to avoid the issue because it's not a a popular issue, uh, to say the least. Um, Harris is using it especially to motivate her base. There's also the contentious issue, Clifford, of race. Uh, Harris's origins have been questioned. We're seeing the attacks on Puerto Ricans, on Haitians earlier. Is this an election which is dividing America on race grounds? Is that a major factor? I think it's difficult to separate out race from uh, from immigration. These sort of this this sort of issue or these issues are intertwined. I think ultimately, in a broad brushstroke, um, uh, you know, the, the immigration issue kind of includes all of these different sort of race and ethnicity um, uh, uh, based. Um, perspectives. Uh, obviously, Trump has a view of the world and his base has a view of the world, which is more restrictive in nature, um, believe that the requirements to become an American should be higher, it should be more difficult to become an American. And obviously, on the other hand, Harris uh, represents uh, a trend in America where the, the belief is that America is a diverse place. Um, uh, it's a large tent uh, that should include a diverse set of, of people. And, and this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, tension or dispute is playing itself right. out in the election today. Okay, what, four days to go? Yeah. Uh, five days to go for uh, exactly a week. Sorry, I'm getting my dates wrong. Uh, exactly a week to go to Super Tuesday. What, according to you, Clifford, could now make that difference between now and polling day a week from now? 
Yeah, that's uh, excluding a surprise, which is always a surprise, right? Um, I just think that the campaigns have to focus, um, especially on their, their core messages, uh, inflation and the economy. And then those those specific messages that are that resonate with their base to get them out to the polls. Um, that's immigration uh, on Trump's side. That's threats to democracy and abortion um, on Harris's side. And I think that they need to be laser focused between now and then and obviously focus on the swing states, especially Pennsylvania. Clifford Young, thank you so much for joining us here on the India Today Network. We'll keep coming back to you to understand what's happening on the ground because this is really going to get interesting, Rajdeep. This is just the last week before the day, 5th of November, when the country will decide. And I was fascinated when Clifford said 200,000 votes. In a country as large as America, <laughs> 200,000 votes eventually are going to make the big difference. Uh, it is, uh, it is therefore almost a nightmare for pollsters. That's you know, we've had pollsters taking a bit of a hit <laughs> in this country. We're going to see whether they get it right in America. But go ahead, That's Geeta. Um, now, you're looking at approval ratings in national polls, which may show uh, Kamala Harris maintaining a marginal lead over Donald Trump. But the online political gambling markets have been betting big on the former president. Donald Trump online betting sites are showing a noticeable surge of bets backing Trump to win, with many users convinced that he has a strong shot despite the polls. Here's a report. These aren't your usual political pundits. They are betters. Sites like Odds Checker and Kalshi are reporting that wagers on Trump have spiked. And he's currently edging out his competition in the betting world, even if the pollsters are saying otherwise. What's interesting is that betting odds can be more than just numbers. They're often seen as a reflection of public sentiment and confidence. Betters across the globe seem to think Trump's got a shot. The odds for Trump have tightened in the last week and his betting market support could be a mix of faith, hope and maybe a little gamble on the unexpected. Currently, Trump holds a 51.1% chance of winning the 2024 election compared to Harris's 47.6%. This is according to the real clear politics average of betting markets. In the betting world, this isn't just a reflection of voter support, but also a financial opportunity. As more gamblers put money on him, the odds shorten, making him an attractive, potentially high yield risk in the eyes of these betting enthusiasts. But now the question is, why are people betting on Trump when polling data shows the race could go either way? Analysts suggest several reasons. One factor might be the unpredictability of polling itself. Many believe the polls aren't capturing the silent Trump voters. Another reason is that betting isn't always logical. Sometimes people bet on what they hope will happen, not necessarily what's likely. Election betting does give us an alternative perspective. But let's be clear, it's not a predictor of the actual outcome. Betting odds and polls work differently. Polls gather data from voters, while betting markets reflect who gamblers think will win. However, it's an interesting look at where global confidence is leaning, even if it sometimes goes against the poll numbers. Back in 2016, prediction markets were overwhelmingly convinced that Hillary Clinton would beat Trump in the presidential election, which turned out to be wrong. But so were the polls. Similarly, in 2022, these betting markets predicted a red wave for Republicans in that year's congressional elections, which simply did not materialize. So, which is better? Polls are generally great at telling us what voters are saying, but prediction markets are a unique way to gauge what the people are willing to put their money behind. Both are strengths, but neither is crystal ball. Right now, the race is close, 
and whether the polls or the markets get it right in 2024 will be interesting to watch. With Shashank Mattu, Bureau Report, India Today. Well, that's all that we have time for in this edition of Elections Unlocked US Special. But you can watch all the detailed coverage on our international YouTube channel, India Today Global. That's right. You can uh, get all the details on India Today Global. But before we wrap up, we leave you with these visuals of Diwali celebrations at White House. Uh, the US President Joe Biden hosting that grand celebration, praising Kamala Harris, calling her smart, tough and experienced, applauding South Asians for their story as immigrants and their contribution to American life. All we can hope and wonder who will be bursting the crackers on the 5th of November. For now, thanks for watching the iconic Indian song, Jai Ho, being played on Diwali Day. Bye for now.